Hello and welcome to the Ontario Science Center's live stream. Uh, my name is Megan, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm a researcher programmer here at the Science Center. Now, live captions for today's event are available on YouTube and on Facebook, and you can activate those by clicking on the closed captions button at the bottom of your screen. You may notice I've got my mask off for this live stream, and that's because the area I'm in is closed and protected, but when you visit the Science Center, you should definitely still wear your mask. So welcome to everyone watching today. Um, I'd love to hear where you're tuning in from today. So the chat is open and you can post in there to say hi. Uh, throughout the event, you can also post any questions you have in the chat and we'll do our best to get to as many of those as we can at the end of the event today. Now I'm joining you from inside the Science Center and I'm actually in the Bug Lab exhibit. Uh, it's a special traveling exhibit we have here, and it came to the Science Center from Te Papa Museum in Wellington, New Zealand, which is pretty far away. You can see if you can find it on a map. Uh, this exhibit was developed with Weta Works, and those are the people who worked on Lord of the Rings. So you can see why there's these giant larger than life models with me here. Uh, you get to see the world from the bugs perspective and learn about what we've learned from bugs. Uh, so today, I'd actually also like to welcome one of my friends and colleagues, Tim. Uh, if you've visited the Science Center before, you or watched one of our other live streams, you might have met Tim already. Tim, could you tell everyone watching a little bit about what you do here at the Science Center? Sure. So I'm a biologist at the Ontario Science Center, and I oversee the care of all the living things, and that includes all the insects. And the insects are actually one of the more interesting of all the animals that we have here. And I'm also in bug lab as well. At the end, we'll zoom out or whatever, but I'm inside a replica of a giant uh, a honeybee hive. So it's pretty cool. That's amazing. I'm happy, I'm happy you're here with us today too, Tim. And let's see first where everyone is joining us from today. I see we have some people from Georgina, Ontario. Uh, we have a grade two class from Central Manitoulin Public School in Minden Moya in Manitoulin Island. That's amazing. We have some people from Kitchener, from Niagara, from really all over. So welcome to everyone watching. We're so happy you're here. Uh, it's great to see people from so many different places today. And it's, it's really important for us to think about the and learn about the places, the land where we live, work and play. So it's impossible to do this though without acknowledging and respecting the indigenous peoples who have been caring for this land since time immemorial and continue to care for it today. Now I'm at the Science Center in Toronto and this building sits on the lands and territories of many nations, including the Anishinaabe Nation, the Haudenosaunee peoples, uh, the Wendat peoples, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. And this land is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Uh, the area that we call Toronto is also governed by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Dish with One Spoon wampum. So I'm a settler, which means my family came to this land from somewhere else, and I'm really grateful to be able to live and work and learn here. I know some of you watching today might be tuning in from places outside of Toronto. Uh, so I encourage you to really learn about the peoples, the treaties, and the histories of the land where you were from. Uh, the site whose.land uh, is one of those really helpful starting points and it's a web-based app that you can use to help identify the indigenous nations and territories across Canada. So it's, it's really important that we do respect and learn about the land and this includes all the peoples and the creatures that live on it, no matter how, how small they are. Now you might have guessed what we're going to be talking about today based on the giant friends behind Tim and I, uh, but also maybe the, the title of the live stream. It's called Awesome Arthropods. Now what is an arthropod? So I have a question for everyone tuning in today, and I think we can pull that up right now. We have a slide. Let's see. So which of these creatures are arthropods? And you can write your answers in the chat. And while you're writing, let's see what sort of creatures we have here. We have a butterfly. We have what looks like a crab there with its pincers. We have an ant. We have a millipede with many, many, many legs. We have a tarantula. And it looks like we've got a scorpion as well. So I wonder, hmm, which of these, which of these are arthropods? 
let's see. I'll see what people have said. I don't know if anyone's gotten in there. I see some people saying most of them. I see someone saying that the <laughs> ant is an arthropod. Ooh, someone said the scorpion. Uh, someone said fourmi. So that's ant en français. Uh, lots of people focusing on those sort of, those little creepy crawlies there. So it's actually a bit of a trick question. Let's see if we can reveal the answer now. Let's see. So all of these are arthropods. So there, was, were there any in there that sort of maybe surprised you a little bit? Pro probably the crab, actually, because that seems sort of like an outlier. But crustaceans are a part of this same big group. Uh, and they all have a few things in common. So, and like, I know, I know some people might be a little nervous about insects or about these critters. They might feel a little scary, that's okay. So today, Tim and I are gonna try and show you that they're actually pretty amazing and really helpful to us in a lot of ways. And you'll actually get to meet some of our friends. Now, I think Tim is getting one of our first friends ready over there. We're specifically gonna be looking at insects today and Tim has an insect that he's gonna show us pretty soon. What do, what do you have there, Tim? Okay, let me get up close here so you can see. Oh, wow. <laughs> All that? right, so this is not your typical, uh, it's, a, it's a stick insect, but this one's a New Guinea um, spiny stick insect. So to me, it almost looks more like a log than a stick. Uh, because these ones are, have a little different life than the one that uh, Megan has, because these ones live on the ground. They hide out there in the ground, as you can see, it blends in really well with the logs. So they hide under the logs, around the base of the tree, and they just sleep during the day and hide out so they don't get eaten by something bigger than themselves. And then they climb up the tree during the night when no one can really see them, and that's when they feed on the leaves. So these guys strictly eat leaves. So they look pretty big, got a pretty big body, you see the antenna, the head and everything. And then just let you know at the end, so people don't get, uh, don't, don't get too scared. That's not a, a stinger. That's an actual, they call it an ovipositor. So that's what the female uh, stick insect uses to deposit the eggs in the soil. So very, that's... very insect and very big insect. Yeah. Now that, that she's super cool, and I know we know she's an insect, but we're going to look at one of the one of the questions about insects that I have here. So for us humans, we have two arms, two legs usually, but how many how many legs do you think insects have? And uh, people can write their answers in the chat. This might be an easy one, but let's let's look at Tim's friend there and and maybe count. So let's see, Tim, how many how many legs on your friend? Yeah, that's a little better angle. See if you can see them all. I see. I see one, two, three, four, five, six. Six legs. So that's that's an insect right there. Insects have six legs. And you can see on those legs, I guess they've got joints as well that let them bend there. Oh, I see some people writing six, eight, or twelve in the chat, and that's that's interesting. Insects only have six, but you might be thinking of other types of arthropods there. Um, and Tim, can you talk a little bit about the body parts on that on that insect there? Yeah, so you can sort of see insects, of course, have three body parts. So the head, and the head's at the front. That's the part that has the eyes and the mouth and the antenna. And then is the, the next part of that part is the thorax, and that's where all the legs are attached to. And also, if there was wings, because many insects, of course, have wings, like butterflies, beetles, and, and that kind of thing. And then the, uh, the abdomen is the final part. And that's part is where all the important organs are in the insect. And in some cases like bees and wasps, like I'm inside the beehive, they have stingers. So they just mm -hmm. have three body parts, that's it. It's a little different than us. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we've only got our, our heads and our sort of torsos there. And I saw someone asked, is that a real insect or is it a model? And it's very much real. No, it's just real. Like she still. just very, she doesn't move a lot. Yeah, <laughs> that's just instinct for her, so. <laughs> this is her nap time too, I guess. She's normally more active at night. Thanks so much, Tim, for showing us her. I actually have a friend here who's kind of similar to Tim's friend. And this is another type. Oh, she's doing a beautiful pose right now. She might be a bit distracted by the light there. So this is another type of walking stick insect. Uh, this is a Thailand walking stick. And she's arboreal as well. So she lives in the forest and she's from Vietnam, Cambodia and Thailand. 
and she eats leaves and plants and she's most active at night so she's nocturnal and this lets her hide from predators during the day so you can see her right there she's holding pretty still right now but what does she look like you can write your answers in the chat i think again this might be an easy question she looks to me and i think to some of our viewers a lot like a stick now I'm wondering, have any of you ever played hide and seek before? So she's she's a master at hide and seek here. She's using something called mimicry, where she can pretend to be something else by looking or acting or moving like that thing. So when she gets scared, she'll flatten her legs and her arms along her body and she'll fall to the ground just like a twig. And you can also see she has this really sort of brown bumpy body that lets her camouflage in really well with her environment. And that lets her hide in plain sight. So these camouflage and mimicry, oh, she's almost trying to climb onto the camera there. These are uh, what we call adaptations. And there's something that, that help insects survive. So I have a challenge for you now while I'm gonna put my little friend away here. You can say goodbye to her for a bit. Uh, so my challenge is I'm gonna show you a picture and I want you to try and figure out how many walking stick insects can you find in this photo. So I'll give you a few seconds to do that there. And I'll see what people say. I'm going to put my little friend away. I wonder what people are going to be able to find. Let's see. You can get off my finger. There you go. So let's see. Hmm. I wonder. Has anyone been able to find it? Someone said that the walking stick looked like an adat from Star Wars, which is pretty true. What's her name? I don't have a name for her yet. Uh, I, I, I know it's a she because she has little wings on the back there. So I wonder if anyone's, oh, someone said two question mark. Uh, someone said four, which uh, once someone said one, another person said two. I think someone said zero and that's fair enough. Another answer for four. I wonder if we can reveal our first walking stick here. Let's see. So there's at least one. Let's see if there's any more. Let's see. Hmm. Maybe reveal the second one. There's the second one. And there are actually three in this photo. So let's reveal our final one there. That's amazing. So we found all three walk. Someone said 10 and I, there's probably 10 real sticks in there as well. Um, so now, I like that's absolutely amazing. I really wish I was that good at hiding. Now I have another friend who's really good at hiding at camouflage and mimicry right behind me here. So we can we can take away the quiz and back here, does anyone know what type of insect this is? So that's an orchid mantis. She uses her appearance to trick her predators, the things that wanna eat her, and her prey, the things she wants to eat. So she's from the tropical forests in Southeast Asia, and she's so attractive to her food that it comes right to her. She looks exactly like a flower here, and to us it looks like she blends in perfectly, like I spy or where's Waldo? But for her, actually to her prey, they see differently than we do, and she looks even better than a flower, so she can lure them in and ambush them. Now, I don't have an orchid mantis here today, but I think Tim has another type of mantis that he's ready to show you here. So let's see, Tim, what do you have? Oh, Tim, we can't hear you. We might have- The host muted me. There we go. <laughs> we can hear you again. So if you can hold okay. up a little higher there, near to yeah, the- just right. <laughs> Oh, to the, to the right you. a little bit. Shoot to the right and a little higher. There, there we go. go. Perfect. All oh, right. Wow. Hopefully you What's can see that? her. So that's a she's a it's a giant Asian mantis. Now you might say, but Tim, it doesn't look very giant right now, <laughs> but that's because she's still a baby. So she's gonna grow three times that size by the time she's full grown. So almost 10 centimeters. So a little bigger than our praying mantis. We have praying mantises in Ontario. And they're usually, the females are green and the males are brown. So these, this particular species can be yellow, brown, green, all different colors. So, and she's pretty, pretty active today. But anyways, yeah. yeah so, so she, of course, as you're talking about camouflage, 
she blends in really well, obviously, with, you know, any vegetation that's sort of dead and dying, like dead leaves or, you know, um, grasses or whatever that's brown. So pretty yeah. cool. She's and beautiful. Because she's a predator. <laughs> yeah, these are predators, too. I have another mantis here, too, actually. And they, you can see that uh, they will they come in all sort of different shapes and different sizes. So we'll switch over here. Now, this one also has the word giant in its name, and it is a little bigger. She's almost full grown here. So this is a giant deadleaf mantis, and she's native to Southeast Asia. And so she's, again, looks different than the ones we have here in Canada, but she looks exactly like a dead leaf. Oh, and she's raising her wings a little bit. So I'm wondering if she's gonna fly. You can see at her back there, she's got those two wings folded along her abdomen. I'm gonna try and convince her to walk onto my other hand. She's watching me very closely here. So, and I know she's a she, because the females actually look different than males. They've got bigger bodies, um, and like a, like the walking stick, she uses mimicry to blend in. So she actually will hang upside down from a branch and sort of sway from side to side to mimic a dead leaf in the breeze. And I'll let her walk along my arm here for a little bit. And you can see her watching me with her eyes there. Now, humans have, have two eyes we have right here, and they're pretty straightforward, one lens in each of them. And, but I have another question for you about mantises here. So how many eyes does a mantis have? Let's see. So while, while we're looking at that, trying to figure it out, I wonder, I can try and pull her back up closer to here so we can see as well. So while you're answering that question, I think Tim has another friend with him there. So we can flip to Tim and maybe see what other type of mantis he has. So here, now this one is a little smaller than the last one. No, tiny. Here we go. Hopefully you can see this one's called a shield mantis. So this one comes from uh, the island of Java in Indonesia, lives in the tropical forest. So this one has a different kind of camouflage because unlike the one Megan just showed you, this one is green. So it's gonna blend in with the leaves. And actually the reason it's called a shield is because you look right up where the head is and it has a weird extension to its thorax that makes it look like a green leaf. So that of course is gonna get bigger and bigger. This one's only small too. It's gonna get, a, it's gonna get twice the size probably by the time it's full grown. So this one again is gonna try to look like a leaf and for mantids, it's kind of a neat thing because when you talk about camouflage with the stick insects, they camouflage because they don't wanna get eaten. And then for mantises, uh, you know, world it's a little different because yes they want to hide from a bigger predator so they don't get eaten but they want to hide too so they can catch prey to eat them so it's kind of a, a double thing for them a double bonus so for yeah sure. it's another another really neat adaptation to make them you know really blend in with the leaves on the trees that's so cool thanks for showing us the shield mantis too tim and now i think i think i've seen a lot of people answering the question so if we flip back to the side i saw lots of people saying four a couple people saying eight some saying two let's reveal the answer for everybody here let's see how many eyes does amanda have and the answer is five actually might have been a little bit unexpected there so they've got mm -hmm. those two big compound eyes that have many lenses and those are really good at seeing movement and seeing depth but they also have three little simple eyes in the center of their heads and those help them sense light so she's an excellent hunter for this reason and you may actually also see my mantis friend here rotating her head around they can rotate their heads almost a, like 180 degrees, which is really, really impressive. I heard some people ask in the chat too, if I was afraid of her. And even though she's a predator, she's not super scary to me. Um, here at the Science Center, she eats crickets though. So she's probably very intimidating to them. Uh, and in the wild, some of the bigger mantises can even take down small birds or frogs. So it's pretty impressive. And I can see her, she's still watching me here as I go around. So I'm going to get ready to put my little friend away soon. But while while I'm putting her away, maybe Tim can show us our final final mantis friend there. If he has it. So up here so you can see 
So this one actually is really cool. So this little guy is a African twig mantis. So this one has gone sort of the root of the, of the stick insect, trying to look like a, a stick or a small twig. And so you can see he even like holds his arms, front, front arms in a certain way, and his body looks just like a stick. So really, really cool. So another adaptation for, you know, the mantis to hide and wait for some, some prey to come by. That's amazing. That one looks so different from the other ones too. A lot skinnier and. Yes. Yeah. Well, on the move. Yeah. Fast. <laughs> I do see um, it has though those same arms and you'll notice this if you looked at them, they have those modified front arms. Mine, my uh, giant uh, dead leaf mantis had those sort of spikes on the front and those are called raptorial arms which you may remember from like velociraptors in jurassic park and they can strike really quickly and grab their prey with their arms our reaction time is usually between 150 300 milliseconds mantises are between 50 and 70 so they're two to three times as fast as we are so do you think you could catch a bug for dinner tim <laughs> probably not we're not i don't know <laughs> just interesting. I was just going to point out that I think because I was trying to handle him, he got scared, and now he's gone full on stick mode. So oh, see how yeah. The mantids have their feet, their front legs out the front in sort of uh, angled pose, right? So this one's pretending it's a total stick, or whatever. So stick. I guess I startled That's them. amazing. <laughs> it's so cool to see how different they can look, even though they're from this same big family. That's yes. Amazing. Thanks for showing us that one, Tim. No now, problem. Everyone, remember from before, we were talking about how insects have sort of three body parts and six legs with joints. We've seen some special types of joints on the mantises there. Now, there's something else about bugs, about insects that makes them really special, and that's called an exoskeleton. So first off, where is your skeleton? Now, I'm pretty sure mine is inside my body right now. My bones are in there. And that's that's called an endoskeleton because endo means inside. Now I have my friend here who is, well, hi Fred. Uh, Fred is just an endoskeleton. He's not even really endo anymore. He's just a skeleton. But our, our skeletons, our bones are really important because they help our body stay in the shape it's in. So it's not just an amorphous blob and they give your muscles a place to attach that lets you run, spin, jump, move. And it even, your bones even make your blood and they can protect your organs like your heart and your lungs. So insects and other arthropods though, their exoskeletons are on the outsides of their body. Their exo means outside. Now it's this really sort of strong, hard outer covering what could I do to Fred to maybe give him something like an exoskeleton, something outside of his body? Hmm. I wonder. Let me see. I think I have something here that might work. So if I put this helmet on Fred, now Fred's head has, has more protection. And you might think of other examples like superhero armor. Um, there's some really cool applications of how we've learned from insects to build human exoskeletons that can help with rehabilitation and other things. Now, there's like actually also some really amazing exoskeletons though, just in the insect world. And I think Tim has a couple of insects here to show us that have really great, really strong exoskeletons and are really good at surviving in a lot of different conditions. So Tim, Tim, can you share our, our next friends with us here? Yeah, so this is a, uh, one that not too many people are very fond of. So it's a giant oh. cave cockroach, one of the <laughs> largest cockroaches in the world. And as you can see, this one, what you're looking at, that's the wings. And then the head and everything are sort of under there. If you look underneath a little bit, you can see them. So they live in like caves and hollowed out logs in Costa Rica and Central America. And they're very important actually, because they help decompose the wood and, and break it back down so the plants can use it. So very, very beneficial insect that way. Not everybody's favorite. And of course, one thing I got to mention too, as you can see, is they do not bite because they're decomposers. Their mouth parts aren't made for that. If it was a beetle and it was this size, I'd have to be careful because they have mouth parts that can bite, but not these guys, so. No, oh, really, it's actually really. kind of beautiful. Yeah, 
It even has like sort of stripes underneath there. It's really big though. Yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. I have I have another friend from again the same sort of family as as Tim's friends there. I actually have two here. And I wonder if you can see them. They're they're sitting on their little log relaxing. So these are Madagascar hissing cockroaches. And they're a little different than the cockroaches that Tim had. So Tim mentioned his had wings there. Uh, these ones actually will never grow wings. So you can see though, they have these sort of plates on their abdomen for flexibility. And if you look at this thorax here of the male, it's got these two big bumps. They're called pronotal humps. And they, the males use those for pushing each other and sort of fighting it out for the best territory and the best females. This one here is a female, oh, sorry friend. And she is actually, she doesn't have those big sort of humps there. Now these ones, they're, they're, they're okay right now in the light, but they generally like to hide in the dark, like Tim said. And you can see they're feeling everywhere with their little antennae as they go. And I, w I wonder if you could move around with your eyes closed. It'd probably be pretty tricky, but for them, they're, they're very good at that. Now, these cockroaches too also have a really special adaptation and it's in their name because they're Madagascar hissing cockroaches. So when they get nervous or when they get scared, they make a hissing sound. Now they have little holes along their bodies called spiracles, and they can actually also use those to breathe. But when they, when they get scared, they force air out of them, kind of like, like a whistle, if any of you can whistle. So like, I can't, I've never been able to, but they force air out and it makes a noise kind of like, which is a good way of scaring off things that might want to eat them. Some of the males also use it to communicate. But I think I think sometimes cockroaches get a bit of a bad reputation. Uh, but I don't know, I think they're, they're pretty cute. And a lot of people say they make really good pets, these ones especially. They're a lot easier to care for than a dog. Oh, she's actually sort of playing with the, the bark there. And I wonder, so like for them, this exoskeleton that they have is a bit like a protective suit of armor. It protects them uh, really well. It's very hard. I can, I can sort of feel it right now, but it's, it's really tricky then because how do you grow when you're wearing this protective suit of armor all the time? So they have to do something called molting and that's where they split their exoskeleton open and emerge from it. They're all kind of squishy in a different color and they have to wait for their new skeleton underneath to harden and hope they don't get eaten in the meantime. So for us, it's a lot easier. We just grow out of our clothes and we get some hand-me-downs or our parents or families buy us some new ones, but they have to split open their whole skeleton. And I actually have a photo of one of our Madagascar hissing cockroaches right after it had molted. And you can see it looks a little bit different there than, than what it did here. So how does it look different? I, I see a lot of people in the chat are debating whether they could keep one of these as a pet. Some people are saying 1000%, I could have this as a pet. Other people are saying it's too creepy. <laughs> I don't know, I think I really, I've really enjoyed working with them. I think they make great friends here. So you can see that the, the molted cockroach there, it's pale white, it's even a little juicy. And those two black dots near its antennae, those are its eyes. Um, and so eventually it'll, it'll hide. It, it, right after I took this picture, it went into a little crevice and wait until its new exoskeleton hardened because it swelled itself up and grew a little bit. Some people are saying these are kind of cute and I would agree as well. So that's, that's one example of molting there. I actually can also show you here, I have with me um, a molt from our mantis that you met before. So the giant dead leaf mantis, the last time she molted, she left this behind. And so this is her old exoskeleton. And it's, very, it's like exactly like her body. You can see it very right down to the detail where her eyes were. So it's just really neat to see and think of all the work that they have to do to just grow. They have to shed their whole old exoskeleton. Now, I think, Tim, I, I don't know, did you have another roach there or are we on to our next our next set? Of no, roaches? I have one more, so. Okay, awesome, Tim will show us one more cockroach. She's <laughs> the biggest one. See if I can get over this way. She's on my arm, so. Oh, wow. Over here. 
Let me see. There oh, there you go. She's, she's even bigger, heavier than the last one. So this is a giant peppered cockroach. Wow. And you know what? She probably weighs as much as like, if you guys know your, your birds that we have in the winter, like chickadees, she weighs as much as a chickadee. So oh very, God. very heavy cockroach. In fact, again, with even the last one, I forgot to mention these, the, this species and the giant Cape cockroach both have wings, but they can't fly. So they're, they're just too heavy to fly. And so this one oh, even, okay. doesn't even like to go into cave stuff. It likes to live on the forest floor under the leaves. And again, helps decompose blow both the both plant and animal matter. So helps break things down and puts that nutrients back in the soil. So very important. Right. Yeah. It's neat. We might think of them as a, a little scary, like when we see them on the subway or something, but they're actually doing a really important thing for us. Wouldn't see buns this big in a subway, hopefully. Yeah, no, hopefully not. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. It's it's neat to see all the different ways that, that insects can help us in our lives. Yeah. I, I wonder, so we talked a little bit about some of the changes that insects have to undergo to, to grow. We talked about molting. And there's an even more extreme change that some of them can do, and that's called metamorphosis. Now, you might have heard that word before. Can you think of any insects that undergo metamorphosis? And I think I think of one classic example that's probably going to come up for a lot of a lot of people. And that's the, the monarch butterfly. So butterflies and moths really do go undergo metamorphosis a lot. They start off as a little egg and then they turn into caterpillars and then they go in a cocoon or a pupa and they emerge as a butterfly or a moth with wings. So it'd be like if you went to sleep for a month and then woke up and came out of your room and you looked completely different. You had your arms in different places, your legs in different places. Now, Tim has a really special, interesting friend that undergoes metamorphosis that has been really important to us as people. So I'll flip back to Tim and let's take a look at what he's got there. Yeah, so this is one of the most important insects that there is in the world. If you guys can see, let me just move a little bit over this way. There. Oh, wow. So you can see there's some caterpillars in there and those are silkworm caterpillars and that big green thing is actually mulberry that's sort of been mushed up and made into a gel like a paste that they can eat because believe it or not that the it's the only uh type of plant to eat is mulberry so anyway so this believe it or not not to creep anybody out whatever but this is where your silk comes from silkworms have been domesticated for almost five thousand years uh originally from in china whatever now they're, of course all over the world and when they spin their cocoons and of course then the pupa is inside the cocoon protects them the cocoon is made out of a single thread that they keep spinning around and around and it can be between 500 to 900 meters long and so that's where the, the where they get the the uh the silk from so i've got some of that to show you too just to show you what they look like oh they kind those of are like, beautiful they sort of look like eggs right and you can see there's a hole in the one in because of course when the caterpillar comes out it makes a makes a big hole but yeah, what do, they, what do they feel like, Tim? Well, of course, it's just you know what, not as probably nice as as the actual like your your scarf or your sweater or whatever. But it does you know feel pretty soft because it's silk. So, but amazing, amazing insects. So we got to thank them for all the nice silk that people wear and uh, and yeah, for many many thousands of years. So very beneficial insect, one of many. And a very, very picky eater, like you said, too. Probably yes. pickier than some of my friends. Yes. <laughs> that's, oh, that's so cool. Now, I have, I have another type of caterpillar here as well to show everyone. And these ones are really cool looking, but aren't as helpful to us as humans. So, and some people, I know right away, if I ask you what these look like, someone might say a gummy worm, and you'd be pretty close. These are tobacco hornworms here, and I've got two of them on my hand, and they're at slightly different life stages, but these are, hey, stop chewing on me. They're, they're little uh, pests for us as humans. So they, you can find these in your garden here in Canada, and they eat plants from the nightshade family. So things like tomatoes, eggplants, really things like that. And they have some legs at the front there. There's six true legs. I'm gonna move this friend around so he stops wrapping himself on my hand there. 
and they they eat a lot so they'll eat the leaves off your plants they eat they molt they grow they eat they molt they grow so you can see i've got two here and these are just maybe a week apart in terms of size this little one will eventually eat enough to get to the size that this big one is here and then after they're about that size they're ready for their big change so they burrow into the ground which is kind of different than what we think about for some some caterpillars and they're going to then make a pupa so i have an example of one of their pupa here let me just grab it and so i'll hold it up first this is a hornworm pupa so it's a little different than the silkworm cocoon that tim showed you it's a little more sort of hard it's a darker color you can see in comparison to the size of the big caterpillar there how big it is and so they they go inside that pupa they make they make it for themselves they sort of split their skin open go in there and then eventually they'll emerge as something else and I think I have another question for everyone. What do you think will come out of this pupa here? So let's see, which moth will emerge from the tobacco hornworm pupa? So it's, it's a, this is a tricky question. This one might be a little harder. I'm gonna put this down here. And while we're, while we're thinking about that question, you can write your answers in the chat. I'll tell you a little bit about each of these moths. Some people are saying they see a gummy worm and wow, they grow quickly. That's, that's very much true. So the first <laughs> moth there, and the clues aren't in the name, so it'll be tricky. Um, so it's a poly, oh, sorry, polyphemus moth. And they're, um, they're really good at distracting predators with those sort of eye spots on their wings. And then the second one, B, is actually an LDD moth, which is another pest that's caused a lot of problems for trees in Ontario lately. Um, their caterpillars eat and eat and eat the leaves off the trees. Uh, so they're, they're another pest insect. We also have C as a luna moth. Uh, and the adults of that species, they don't eat. They have no digestive system. So they just emerge from their, their pupa and mate, and then they die. So it's a very short adult life for them. And then the last one, D, is a hawk moth. Uh, and they're pretty cool because they have thinner wings than other moths, and they're really good at flying compared to other moths. So I see some people saying D or B. Someone changed their response, actually C. Uh, some people think B, some D, a lot of Cs, a lot of Bs. So for these ones, actually, let's reveal the answer here. D, they, they turn into a hawk moth when they come out. And it's interesting to see, oh, stop biting me. And one of them actually just pooped in my hand, which was really fun. Um, they, they will emerge as, as hawk moths. Um, and so the, the color, the, the shape and the color of the caterpillar don't always match the color of the moth that comes out afterwards. And then those moths, the females will lay their eggs and then the circle of life continues. <laughs> So now I think we're gonna, while I, I hold these guys, I'll probably put them away soon. We're gonna meet some other, other insects maybe that are helping us in different ways. So we've learned about some of the ways that insects have helped us so far. We saw those silkworms that Tim had, and they're really good at making silk for us that we've used in our clothes. There's types of insects that pollinate plants that we use for food. There's some that bury dung, another way of saying poo, which I could probably use around here now that these caterpillars are pooping all over my hand. They've had a lot to eat today. Um, and some insects are also really good at being pest control for other insects or being food for larger animals. And this can include humans. So I have a big question for you. Should we eat more bugs? And I'm saying more because humans have actually been engaging in entomophagy, which is a fancy word for saying eating bugs, for centuries, for hundreds of years. So it sounds like someone outside of the bug lab here is a little excited about the exhibit too. Now, insects are still a popular food around the world. And there's a strong case that we can make for replacing, oh, you're biting me there a little. You must be hungry again for replacing some of our food with 
protein from insects. We, we consume protein in our diet and maybe we could replace some of that with bugs. And it could be good for both our health and for the health of the environment. Now, I think Tim has a type of insect with him there that's often used as food. So Tim, what do you have there while I put my other friends away? Let's see what Tim's got. So hopefully you can see it. So these are some yummy crickets. Well, at least they're oh, yummy to the they're yummy to the uh, to the reptiles and amphibians at the sites there that I feed them to. So, but uh, but yeah, this is something that people people do eat, and uh, Megan can talk more more about that or whatever because they have a high level of protein in them compared to some larger animals or whatever. But yeah, not some people would think of right off the bat. But yeah, they're they're perfect for all our all our large our lizards and our large frogs and our little frogs like our poison dart frogs, they eat the little tiny crickets. So these are these are called, just called um, house crickets, and they actually have been raised and uh, domesticated for a long time too, since about the 1950s. And of course, it's, it's for uh, people that want to have pets at home that need to be fed crickets. And, you know, people are doing research on animals that they need to feed them to keep them in captivity. So it's great that they're easy to keep and whatever. So yeah, but you can talk more about what they what people can actually do with them for for humans what we do with them for sure those look really cool now tim could you could you eat those crickets would you or would you eat those crickets well, I, guess? I would but unfortunately for me i've been dealing with them all my years at the science center so now i'm allergic to crickets so that's one oh, thing yeah. you got to talk about with because crickets like anything else they have you know protein in their body and and you know mm -hmm. some people are allergic to them right so i've actually one thing i did eat that was fine i have had mealworms or super worms like you've got, I've eaten that in like ice cream and, and cookies and stuff. But yeah, I'm not allergic, allergic to them, but I am to, uh, to the crickets. So no crickets for me. Uh, yeah, so that, that's actually a good point. I was asking a bit of a pointed question there. So for, and I see lots of people tuning in the chat saying, I'm gonna eat all the bugs. So just a bit of a safety disclaimer first, make sure you always ask a grown up that you trust before eating anything. And don't just eat bugs off the ground because those might've ingested other things that could be harmful to you. Um, and also some people can't eat bugs because of allergies like Tim, or even for religious reasons or just for personal choice. And that's okay too. So Tim mentioned, he's right. I have another insect here that's commonly used as food. I'm gonna try and get it angled so we can see it. I have two of them and these are superworms. So they're related to mealworms, which are another insect commonly used as food for things like lizards, turtles, frogs, salamanders, but also for people. Um, and these two, these are actually the larva of a darkling beetle. Um, so a type of beetle has really strong jaws. These ones do too, but they're not interested in biting me right now. They mostly want to eat email, uh, oatmeal, oatmeal, not email. Uh, oatmeal and carrots is what we feed them here at the Science Center. Now, I have a question though for people watching, and I think I've got a picture of it there. So would you rather eat a cricket or a mealworm? And let's see what people say. Someone, someone's saying they're going to fry, fry things up and eat them that way, and that's perfectly valid. So while we're waiting for people to chime in with their answers there, so let's talk about entomophagy or eating bugs a little more. So why can insects be a good food? First off, they're, they're healthy for us. They have a lot of protein, like Tim was talking about. Protein makes our muscles strong. And we need protein from the things we eat because we can't make it in our bodies. And these insects are also good for the environment. So they can be more environmentally friendly than other meat options like beef from cows. Uh, they grow and breed a lot faster than animals do and they're less expensive to raise and they need less food, less space, and very importantly, less fresh water to be raised. Now, I wonder what people have said. <laughs> I see in all caps a couple of answers that say none, but I see the same number of answers that say both. Um, some people saying mealworm, some people saying cricket. So it's, it's really nice to see people chiming in that way. I'm just going to quickly put my friends back in their home there. And then for those of you who said no, I wonder if this could convince you. So I have some cheese puffs here. They look pretty normal, right? But these are actually made using cricket flour. So that's 
flour made of crickets. It's made by grinding up the crickets. And I'm feeling pretty hungry. This live stream has gone for a bit. So I wonder, do you think I should eat a cricket cheese puff? Hmm. I wonder. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm really hungry. I can barely resist this anymore. So I'm going to try it. Hmm. It tastes pretty good. I really like it. I might have more, but maybe after. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. They're good. Tim, do you want any? Oh, wait. No. Allergy, right? <laughs> yeah, I'll have to pass. <laughs> so, unfortunately, I can't share my snack with Tim, but <laughs> I can share some audience questions with Tim. So, I know we've had a lot of people writing in the chat. Someone just said, give me them all. They want to eat all the cricket cheese puffs. So, I can't, unfortunately, share them through the screen. But let's see what people are curious about. So, let me see here. Hmm. Um, some people were asking, uh, let me see here. Oh, interesting. Uh, some people were wondering, can any of these bite us or not? So um, Maziar Modamedi uh, is wondering, can any of these insects that we showed bite us? Tim, do you want to talk a little bit about insect mouth parts or maybe whether we'll get bitten or, bit or not by these? <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. You know what? Most of the ones that we showed that are uh, prey insects, like the walking sticks, the stick insects, whatever, they have really, really tiny. They all have mandibles, but they have really, really tiny ones. And so they're only designed to eat leaves and whatever. So they don't really even attempt to bite people. Um, cockroaches don't, again, because they decompose, they break down things so they don't. Praying mantises do, but unfortunately, the praying mantis is smart enough to know that it's not big enough. Its head's not big enough, even if it was a full-size one, to try to try to bite a person. You know what it would usually do to get you away is it uses its front, um, you know, arms like this and goes like this and tries to push you away, whatever. Doesn't doesn't bother trying to bite you. And then if you're getting into like the mealworms, and mealworms, of course, are are a type of beetle. And yeah, beetles can bite, but usually the smaller ones don't. It's usually the bigger ones do. So it's a very good question. But all all insects have like mandibles, but some are a lot tinier, not as sharp, not as hard or strong as the bigger, as some do, right? The ones that are predators are the ones that have those type. And of course, butterflies, no worries about them, no worries about caterpillars that way, right? That's so cool. Yeah, that's really helpful. I see some people in the chat are talking about how their classes are raising mealworms. And so it's good that you talked about um, sort of their mouth parts as well. Now, someone was asking, Layla was asking, uh, this is an interesting question. Do the, does the shield mantis protect their king? But I think maybe the question that we can take out of this is do mantises live together in groups or, or are they? No, that's there? one thing. That's one type of insect. Yeah, they're not a, a colony insect like a bee or an ant or, or that kind of thing or, or a hornet or wasp. So they just live solitary. Uh, they just hatch out. And when they hatch out, they just go their own way and start growing or whatever until they want to mate and then of course and as someone i noticed in the in the chat mentioned which is true is that is that most mantids if they're not careful the male mantises have to get away really fast after they make because the female mantis if she's hungry she will eat them so it's not fun being a male praying mantis <laughs> yeah no definitely not so I saw another interesting question from Ryan, are some poisonous, and I think not in general for mantises, so none of the bugs that we saw today, he might be meaning venomous, because poisonous would be if we were eating them, but venomous would be if they were stinging us. None of the ones we showed today were venomous, but Tim, I know we've had some venomous insects at the Science Center, or not insects, venomous uh, arachnids at the Science Center in the past. Do you want to talk a little bit about them? Well, yeah, there is there is the insects that, of course, that are that would are the ones that can sting you, right? So bees and wasps and horns and stuff. But yeah, if you're talking about, yeah, and then, of course, then there's scorpions, as we saw at the beginning of the show, too, right? So there's a scorpion has to sting you, right? But then you're right, then there is tarantulas which are, of course arachnids or spiders and they do have some venom and they have to actually bite you now most of the the, the, the funny thing is though with them is that it doesn't matter really that even some of the ones that we see all the times movie stuff they're really big like a mexican orange knee tarantula they look really big they look scary but they're actually not that venomous so they have enough venom to you know stun a small mouse or a, or a, an insect that they're going to eat but that's it but they wouldn't it wouldn't really hurt a person so 
don't have to worry too much about that. Now, one thing about caterpillars, I think hornworms are one of them that is the case is the reason they have those bright colors is to warn away birds because they don't taste very good. So it's sort of like there's other animals that do that too, that it's a warning thing. Monarch cat, butterflies and caterpillars are the same thing, right? So monarch butterflies are supposed to warm with their coloration that don't eat me, I don't taste good. So there is that adaptation for some insects as well. That's really good because I, I saw someone had asked in the chat too. Uh, I think it was, let me see here, Rachel had asked, why are the caterpillars blue? And so that was a, a really good answer for that. Now, thank you so much, everyone, to have submitted all your, your questions in the chat there. If we didn't get to your question today, that's okay. We'll do our best to get any questions left on the Facebook chat after the next few days. Thank you so much, Tim, for joining us and answering all those questions about the bugs and sharing some of our live insect friends here today. No problem. Yeah, it was wonderful to have you here. And thank you also to everyone for tuning in to meet some of the amazing arthropods that we have here at the Ontario Science Centre. And I hope you're feeling inspired to go out and look for some of the amazing bugs that live near you. It'll be spring soon, so there's going to be lots of them that are starting to emerge outdoors. Now, until then, though, you can come visit our special traveling exhibit here at the Science Centre called Bug Lab. And you can come see these larger than life models of different arthropods like the orchid mantis behind me and like those honeybees and the giant uh, hornet that are with Tim over there. And you can see even others, there's dragonflies, there's a uh, jewel wasp that does brain surgery on a cockroach. There's, you can fold your own flying origami butterflies or test your reflexes against a mantis. There's lots of different things for you to try. Bug Lab will be here until April 2nd, so you should definitely come check it out soon. You can find more information about Bug Lab and other exhibits here at the Science Center at our website, ontariosciencecenter.ca. And we also have recordings of past live streams there, including this one and other great science content. So don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our social channels. And I think that's it for us now. So Tim and I are going to fly away and we'll stop bugging you for now. So bye everyone.